Thank you all. Uh, I'm excited to be here. I can't see all of you, but th that's fine. Uh, I am uh, the director of the Center for Depression Research at Clinical Care at UT Southwestern in the psychiatry department. Uh, but I promise you, I'm not going to talk about how depressing it is to think about this. Everybody talks, knows this, and be, there is a lot of communication in the, in the general public about the fact that the depression rates are increasing, especially in the youth in the United States over the last 10 years. And yet, I think we have not figured out how best to think about this, how to address this. So what I'm going to take the next 10 minutes to do is to leave you with a much more optimistic view, not get depressed about this, but we have actionable things we can immediately start putting in place that can reduce these rates tremendously. So that is really the focus of a lot of my work. This, as you can see, is a com editorial that I put in the Dallas Morning News. Whenever there is a shooting, there's a whole lot of attention to this, and then we forget about it. So there is, unfortunately, a focus on really stark events that makes people think about mental health, and yet we then forget about what to do. Would you believe that this, this editorial was something I wrote in response to a something happened five years back. And yet, we have not actually tr changed the way we think about depression, how we address it, what do we do to prevent it. None of that has really changed society as fast as I would have hoped. So our goal at our center here is to really expand the whole work that prevents us from having to deal with this all the time. This is something that we have to put a stop to and it's not going to put a stop to this by just waiting for another tragedy before we address some of it and then forget. So one of the major things we have to do is to start thinking proactively. If I were to ask all of you, raise your hand, or how many had an annual physical last year? Most of you will raise your hands. If I then ask you to raise your hand if you had an annual mental health checkup last year, how many of you would raise your hand? This is really out of the whole audience, one or two people are raising your hand. And actually, mental health, especially in the young, is really one of the major hurdles in accomplishing all the goals that you just heard from your teacher. Those goals are really difficult if mental health issues are not addressed. And yet, we as a society, we have a health system, we have educational institutions, that pay much less attention to it and still require you to do an annual physical. Of all the kids who raised your hands who had an annual physical, I can tell you the majority, the vast majority, the vast majority of you had no problems in their physical exams. But mental health checkups don't get done. So we have to change the way we are thinking about this if we're going to make a difference in society. So one of the things we have to start thinking about is the stress is common. Depression is one of, the other, one of the stress disorders, but stress is something that a lot of people experience. I'll tell you, give you an example. I had to come out and give a talk. I also experience it. I then know how to figure out what I'm going to do when I get on the stage. This kind of stress where there is changes happening, like upcoming tests, homework, lack of organization, too little downtime. A lot of you are so active, so many of you are taking AP courses, you're doing a lot of extracurricular activities, leaves very little downtime. There are, your sleep schedules I know is very affected. I'll show you some of our data. People, especially young people, but everybody is spending so much of their time on social media that, that it, it actually reduces their sleep time. A lot of these things Transitioning to a new environment, you've moved to a new school, a new city, all these things can lead to stress. Stress is normal. Stress actually can help. If you are not feeling any stress and if you have an exam in 10 days, you're not going to study for it. So there has to be some way to figure out how to handle the stress and how to overcome it so that you can function properly. That kind of work is not done in schools, that's not done in youth organizations. That kind of approach so that we begin to focus much more on 
prevention on things that can be done before somebody gets into trouble is the kind of work that we really need to be focusing on. So obviously depression, as I mentioned, is very common. If you think about it, uh, uh, before the pandemic, there was about 12% of youth, 12 to 17 years, had clinical depression that would normally require a pediatrician or a mental health specialist to treat that. One thing I need to remind all of you in the audience is just because somebody has clinical depression does not, does not require medication in all the cases. In fact, in a lot of peop young people, there are many other treatments, including cognitive behavior therapy, other forms of psychotherapy, aggressive aerobic exercise. Many treatments are available, supportive therapy, that can be used to treat it and does not need to lead to medications. And yet, I think we have to rec recognize that of all the people who will ever get depression in their entire life, remember, depression is a brain disease. If you get depression at any point in your entire life, 70% of people will have their first episode of depression before the age of 18. It is the kind of population that you are all. And unfortunately, women or girls have doubled the rate of depression than men. That just got worsened with the pandemic so that now in the United States, about a quarter of the teens have depression following the, the pandemic. A lot of it is because of social isolation. While people are connected, social connection through so, social media, their interpersonal connections, their contacts have reduced over the last many years through the pandemic. And these rates, four out of 10 students reporting experiencing sadness or hopelessness is the kind of thing that can be prevented, but we are not doing enough. And <clears throat> so the other thing about depression that we have to be mindful always is uh, two things. One, it is uh, thoughts of death and suicide, unfortunately, in the teens in the United States, again, are going up. Right now, about 20% of teens have experienced seriously considered suicide. It still remains the second leading cause of death. Couple of things about this we should remind ourselves. There is a huge myth in the adult population in this country where people, parents, uh, teachers, educators, politicians, everybody worries about not putting the thought of depression or suicide in their teenagers. And I have to tell you that is a myth. If some teenager is experiencing thoughts of death or suicide or depression, and some caring adult in their life asks for it, they will feel relieved. They will open up, they will communicate with you, and we can do something about it with treatment. A well done treatment for depression leads to a normal life. You can see millions of examples in public who have people who have had depression who are now leading very fruitful, very successful careers and lives. So we have to not get scared of this. We need to be aware of it. So what is to be done? I think that my, as I said, a lot of my work at the center is really focused on developing new treatments, trying to develop blood and brain tests, and we will continue to do that for those who already are experiencing depression. There is also a whole lot of work that we are doing at the center in order to try to do early detection so that we, I believe, and the, there are many organizations in the country that are actually recommending this, including the American Academy of Pediatricians, et cetera, that at starting at the age of 12, everybody should be screened for depression and anxiety once a year. So if you are not getting that, you got to to ask for it from your pediatricians. Make sure, if you're a parent, to get the teenagers screened for depression anxiety so that early diagnosis can be done. Early diagnosis can lead to full recovery if the treatment is correct. So that is the second part. Our work, and today I'm mainly going to focus on this, and that is prevention is really key to this. Most of the strides in medicine, whether it is diabetes, whether it is high blood pressure, whether it is heart, heart, uh, heart disease, stroke, cholesterol, etc., have all been 
most significant advances have been made by prevention and early detection. And so prevention is really key. One of the things that we are doing is to help teenagers build resilience against these stressors so that the onset of depression can be delayed or more likely prevented. So how do we prevent it? So resilience, as I mentioned, can be taught. You can build resilience and the ability to bounce back when there are stressors, when there are challenges in life is something that can be taught. And that is really what we are trying to focus on with the, several of these programs. So we have built a risk and resilience network where we partner with schools, with youth organizations, with pediatricians, to deliver this prevention program and early detection program. And so we are trying to raise awareness about mental health. If you are not aware, what ends up happening is a lot of people write off teenage behavior as being just teens being teens. When you're a teenager, or when, if you are a teenager, if there's a significant change from what was in the past to now, that requires attention. So if there, Somebody had a lot of friends who was now isolated, staying in their room, not participating in home activities, etc. That should raise a red flag. If somebody was, is sleeping too much or sleeping too little, etc., and using techniques to increase resilience and ability to bounce back may be our best bet to reduce the rates of depression in the U.S. So we have now implemented a program called Youth Aware of Mental Health. It's a five-session program. Most schools have some mental health awareness programs, but they're didactic. There are lectures. I don't know how many of you students really get excited about one more lecture. I wouldn't. So therefore, what this program is, is an evidence-based program that is based on experience. So what we do is have the whole classroom participate in this. It's a five-session program. Each session is 45 to 60 minutes, and it covers a number of these domains, including uh, uh, role plays, talk, discussions, and this is where kids, students are actually engaged with the activity throughout that 45 to 60 minutes. An example of that, for example, is we have two, two of the students do a role play. Somebody says, one of my friends is having difficulties with depression. How would you handle that? In their play, we give them some scripts, they do a role play, and all the other students then participate in a discussion, provide feedback, and learn about how to recognize mental health in themselves and in their friends, how to ask for help, who to go to ask for help. And all the parents in the audience, you may not be surprised, but you should be aware of it. And that is, when we've done this, we've now done this with about 30,000 students in the North Texas area over the last several years. When we've done this and asked students before and after, about the importance of this program. They've seen it to be very helpful. But one key finding, which is very interesting and, and something we need to be aware of, and that is 82% of these students say that if they are in trouble, they will go to a peer. They will not go to an adult. Therefore, it is better to have all the peers and all the full classroom be educated about this. So this is Really, this education program, which includes role play and a number of experiential aspects, has been a big success in our hands. And that the content of this is really teaching them what is mental health, looking for self-help advice, stress and crisis management, so that you're learning how to build resilience and depression, suicide thoughts, what do you do if you have them or if somebody you know has them, how do you ask for help, mainly helping a friend in need. And in the process, these, uh, the students learn about themselves also. We teach them how to help a friend in need, but it also applies to themselves if they are in need and they know how to then seek help. What can I ask for advice? And the, uh, this increased discussion and knowledge about mental health, developing these problem-solving skills and, and increasing your resilience and emotional intelligence has really been a remarkable shift. We go to classrooms and we do it in, in the ninth grades. And then next year when we go back, the 10th graders are saying, can we do it again? 
So this really has been something that students find very useful in terms of interaction. So how does this program work? It improves their ability to socialize. It increases, as I mentioned, discussion and knowledge about mental health. Resilience increases their adaptive coping and problem-solving skills, particularly learning and help-seeking. Promotion of peer support. I think peer support in this age, but even in adults, but in this age particularly, is even more important. If peers are ignoring your problems or ignoring when you tell them something, that has a negative impact. This allows for the whole population of the student body to become more aware, more, more ready to help. And that has been something that we found to be very useful. It reduces, when we have done this in schools, it reduces rates of depression, anxiety, and suicide in those students who have had this experience. We are also building additional programs that are mapped to the kinds of brain dysfunction you see in people who are having difficulty with stress, or for that matter, depression. An example for it is somebody who is prone to developing depression or has depression has much more difficulty dealing with negative emotions. So if they get negative input from, especially from family or friends, that seems to have a much larger and a much more greater effect on them so that they are functioning for several days, several months after that becomes negative. If somebody criticizes the way they look, somebody criticizes the way they talk, that has a big impact. So that, and we've done brain imaging research showing that that affects on the brain circuits that are responsible for regulating negative emotions. So what we've done is built a program that actually addresses these like emotion recognition and management, to teaching them how to develop relaxation activities and and one of the things is, uh, the way I got into it is with my son as he was finishing high school. If you tell them, I as a parent did the same, I tell them you should now go and relax. Nobody teaches teenagers about what that translates into in real life. Just saying go relax doesn't do it. You have to teach them how to develop these habits so that they can relax, have a downtime, and be able to be mindful of the current situation, how to plan for the future. You have to help them develop empathic relationships to, uh, with an attitude for mindfulness, acceptance, and mental flexibility. So this new program called Blue Steel is something we do after the kids have had YAM or even in undergraduate programs. So one final word on social connectedness. Everybody thinks that they are well connected because they are con constantly looking at, face, uh, at into Instagram, TikTok, etc. And so what we did was we have a large statewide research network on, uh, uh, in schools where we are doing this five session program across the entire state in many school districts around the state. And in those programs, we ask these five questions. How many hours do you use social media Monday to Friday, Saturday, Sunday? Do you feel disconnected from friends when you have not logged into any social media? How many of you say, would say that? If somebody took away all your phones, all your phones, at least your phone, and you didn't have access to social media, does social media play an important role in your social relationships, and do you prefer to communicate with others mainly through social media? We looked at just one early data set very recently and one question about how many hours kids use social media. Of that large sample that we are talking about, we, those who, we, we asked the two questions about screening for depression. Those who screen positive for depression, remember they may not be fully depressed, this was just screening, then we have to do follow up. But only those who screen positive and compared them to those who did not screen positive for depression, those who screening positive are spending about five hours more per weekend on social media. We are beginning to try to study this but with much more rigor because we don't know what is the cause and what is the effect. Is it that the use of social media is leading to depression or the reverse? 
We'll find out as we go forward, but it really does show concretely that there is some problem with the social media use in people, especially kids who are prone to depression, and we have to help them learn how to really figure out a way to remain connected with people and yet not actually feel this hollow connection when sometimes uh, they are just on distant social media. So, I think what we have to do, obviously, develop new treatments and identify the right treatment, but we have to identify depression much earlier. We should be routinely screening for depression in the schools and in teenage years. One of these days, my, I've been talking about it for some time. I'm hoping someday that will be picked up. And then we clearly have to put in prevention strategies to build resilience in order to ensure that there are lower rates of depression. We just cannot tolerate these rates of depression continuing to go up. The only way to do this is to put in very rigorous prevention programs. We did the same thing with a lot of medical illnesses. Breast cancer was a big problem for the longest time in the, in the country and in, around the world. When mammograms came into place, that really has made a huge difference. We have to put in early recognition and even more importantly, like with diabetes and other things, prevention programs are essential. So I'm hoping I can convince you that we do not need to be waiting for a crisis before we intervene. I'm going to stop here and thank you very much for your attention.